Now we're going to find the volume of something known as a double cylinder. So a double cylinder is the intersection of two cylinders. So I've put this setup into R3. So we've got the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. And then running down the x-axis, I have a cylinder of radius B. And then running down the y-axis, I have a cylinder of radius A. And our goal is to find the volume of this intersecting object. Now, my picture of this intersection isn't that great. So I'll put a picture that's a little bit better on the screen right now, just to give you guys an idea of what this looks like. Okay, so now let's jump into trying to find this volume. And we'll do this by slicing this with a plane, which is like Z equals Z naught or Z is fixed. But in order to do that, we'd probably like to write down equations for each of these cylinders. So let's talk our way through how we can write down those pretty easily. So let's look at this one first, the one coming down the y-axis. So here we can think about the y component of every point on this cylinder being free to be anything that we want, but then the x and the z components have to build a circle of radius a. So that gives us some motivation for the equation of this cylinder as x squared plus z squared equals a squared. So let's maybe color code that a bit. So this is gonna be the cylinder, which is yellow. And then similarly, we can write down the equation of the cylinder of radius b that's running down the x-axis. So we'll think about it like this. The x component is free to be anything, but the y and the z components have to be along this circle. So I can write it down as y squared plus z squared equals b squared. Again, because it's a circle of radius b in this case. So I'll draw my cylinder of the right color right there. Now, like I said, we're gonna slice this with a horizontal plane. A horizontal plane has the equation z equals a number, so we'll slice it with maybe z equals z naught and see what the picture looks like. So let's maybe write that down. We're gonna slice with the plane z equals z naught. So that means that z is just fixed. So it's fixed arbitrarily, but it cannot change. It's no longer variable. Okay, so that means this equation right here will collapse to x squared plus z naught squared equals a squared, but I'll write that as x squared equals a squared minus z naught squared, keeping in mind that this number over here is now a constant. Maybe let's remind ourselves of that. This is a constant at this point because a is always a constant and z naught has been fixed. Then similarly over here, we'll get y squared equals b squared minus z naught squared. Now we can take the square root of both sides and we'll see that we get x equals plus minus the square root of a squared minus z naught squared. And we'll get y equals plus minus the square root of b squared minus z naught squared. Now we can think about drawing a picture of this in the plane. Because notice what we have here is really just x is fixed to be positive or negative the same number and y is also fixed to be positive or negative the same number. So here, I'll draw this x, y plane, but just keep in mind that this isn't really the x, y plane. This is the copy of the x, y plane where z has been fixed at z naught. So it's lifted up a bit or lifted down a bit. So let's color code this result. So here we have x is either plus or minus this number right here. So plus that number would be like right here and minus that number would be like right there. So here I'll put the square root of a squared minus z naught squared. Then I won't put minus that, but we can just remember that that's the case. So x will always have that value. So if x is always this value, that creates a vertical line. Now we can similarly do the same thing for y. So maybe we'll put here, this is y equals the square root of b squared minus 
z naught squared. So if y is fixed there, then that represents a horizontal line. So I'll draw it like this. And then the negative copy of that would be like down here. So I'll draw that here. But look what we've got. We've got a rectangle and the side length is two times the square root of a squared minus z naught squared by two times that. Two because you know we've got we're going from negative that number to positive that number for the x and the y axis. Let's maybe be clear of that. So this is a rectangle that is two square root of a squared minus z naught squared by two times the square root of b squared minus z naught squared. Great. But it's easy to calculate the area of a rectangle. So the area of this rectangle, maybe I'll put a sub z naught, because it depends on this z naught point, will be equal to four times the square root of a squared minus z naught squared, and then b squared minus z naught squared. So it's getting kind of messy right there, but we'll clean it up when we get it to the next board. Okay, then how do we calculate the volume if this is the area of one of our slices? Well, we'll just integrate that area from the smallest z value to the largest z value. So using symmetry, we can take zero to be the smallest possible z value and then just double the volume that we get because we're looking at the volume just above the z-axis. We'll have a, an exactly the same volume below the z-axis. So we'll take z starting at zero and then it will end at whichever one is smaller, a or b. Let's maybe just say that we have an ordering here where a is less than b, although doing it the other way would be fine as well. So that means we'll have z run from zero to a. Notice if it ran bigger than a, then we'd end up with minus signs under the square root here and that wouldn't make much sense. So let's maybe summarize what we have at the top of the next board and then we can write down an integral which will calculate the following volume. So on the last board, we figured out if we sliced our picture at a fixed z value, we ended up with a rectangle and we calculated that area of that rectangle to be the following function that's in terms of z. So it's four square root of a squared minus z squared times b squared minus z squared. So that means we can easily calculate our volume. So our volume will be the integral of this really as z goes from negative a to positive a. But again, like we hinted at on the last board, this is an even function. So that means that we can just double it and then integrate from zero to a. So if we double it and then also multiply by four, that will give us eight times the integral from zero up to a of the square root of a squared minus z squared times b squared minus z squared. Okay, nice. Now we have that integral to calculate. But unfortunately, I've got some bad news about this integral. There's no closed form for the antiderivative, so we can't express this any more simply than it is right now. This is a so-called elliptical integral. And I'm actually tossing around the idea of making a mini series about elliptical integrals as like afternoon releases. Let me know if you guys wanna see something like that. But if A is equal to B, we can simplify it. So if A is not equal to B, then we can't simplify it. We've got one of those elliptical integrals, but if A is equal to B, well, it simplifies quite nicely. So let's look at the special case when A is equal to B. So I'll write that here. Um, then we'll have the volume is equal to eight, and then the integral from zero to A of a squared minus z squared dz. Because those two are the same, so the square and the square root cancel each other. But now this is just a polynomial function. It's fairly easy to take the antiderivative. So we'll have eight and then a squared times z minus z cubed over three. We need to evaluate that up from zero to a. So evaluating it at the upper end point will give us 16a cubed over 3. Then evaluating at the lower end point will give us 0. So that's the volume in the case when a is equal to b. And like I said, if a is not equal to b, this is something called an elliptic 
integral. And interestingly, elliptic integrals have a lot of applications in modern Ramanujan style number theory. So like I said, I'm thinking about doing a mini series on these types of integrals. Let me know if you'd like to see that. And that's a good place to stop.